Chapter 8 The Great Hall As they entered the great doors of the castle, Lydia saw her uncle with Harry and Draco, Professor Malfoy, she corrected herself, across the entrance hall. The area was busy with students finishing their last lessons of the day, and heading off to their various common rooms, she supposed. She kept losing sight of the three men amongst all the coming and going. They continued to cross the hall towards them. Hagrid, obviously, was having no such problem. Hello, all. The care of magical creatures master greeted them. Ambrose, this little girl of yours has been a bit of a star pupil just now. I'll let her tell you about it. I must go off to have a word with Professor Flitwick before dinner. Hagrid took his leave, and Lydia, aided by Tessa, told the adults about her encounter with the unicorn foal. We would be hard-pressed to give such an enthralling account of our activities, her uncle informed her but I believe we have forged ahead quite admirably. Ron has gone back to the office, and Hermione's gone home, Harry added. They send their love. We will be going into dinner in the Great Hall soon, Draco said. Are you going to join us? Lydia hesitated. I imagine Lydia and Tessa would prefer to dine with their fellow Gryffindors, Ambrose chuckled, rather than break bread with a gaggle of old men like us. No, no. Lydia jumped in. Draco, Harry, it's not like that, really. It's just... Ah, Ambrose nodded. Not with a gaggle of one exceptionally aged man like me. I see. Draco laughed. It's not that, Ambrose. I'm sure Lydia would like to see what life here is like, from the student's point of view. If that's all right, Lydia pleaded. I'm sure that would be acceptable to all involved, her uncle smiled. We shall bid you ladies a good evening and a good night. Perhaps we shall meet over a hearty breakfast. Adieu for the present. The three men turned to leave, but Ambrose turned to add, By the by, if you happen to see us at the top table, please do not wave. We would write to retain our cool mystique. Lydia folded her arms and glowered. I am permitted some degree of self-deception, surely, Ambrose complained. "'Not if you're going to start thinking you're cool,' Lydia corrected him. "'I am with Harry,' her uncle protested. "'You can hardly deny that he is one of the cool kids, now can you?' "'Away with you, uncle,' she mocked. They smiled at each other and went their separate ways. "'I see what you mean by annoying,' Tessa laughed. "'There is something about him, though.' "'It's called delusion,' Lydia said flatly. They laughed again. Tessa and Lydia returned to the Gryffindor common room. It was a whirl of activity. Gryffindors of all years were returning from their various classes laden with books, rushing up to their dormitories, rushing down from their dormitories, giving up on revision for the time being, those who had had study periods, swapping tales about their day, arguing, flirting, arranging gobstones tournaments, swapping chocolate frog cards, hunting down their cats, toads, rats, lizards. Tessa explained to Lydia about familiars, the pets which students were allowed to bring to Hogwarts, some of which had a degree of magical ability. These pets, she told Lydia, were subject to fashion and fad. Lizards had become popular for some reason a few years after the Second Wizarding War. Nobody seemed to know why. Rats had suddenly become popular in the last couple of years. After Professor Longbottom had left the Auras to become a teacher, Toad saw a resurgence. He had had a Toad when he had been a student, and many students, particularly the girls, had followed suit. I think you can guess why, Tessa grinned. No, why? Tessa looked at her for a moment, to see if she was joking. She decided Lydia was serious. They fancy him, of course, she explained. He was in the war, he was in Dumbledore's army, and, well... Look at him. He's a bit of a hunk, you must admit. Lydia narrowed her eyes for a moment. You don't fancy him, though, do you? No, Tessa agreed. But I can see what they mean. You fancy Professor Verdi? Tessa tried to suppress a grin as she looked down at Lydia. Is it obvious? As a... Lydia frowned for a second. Dragon in a teapot. Tessa gave a peal of laughter. Where did that saying come from? I made it up, 
Lydia smiled with a blush. I wanted it to sound a bit wizardish. It certainly sounded witchy. I meant to say tea shop, but it came out wrong. Teapot sounded great, and probably true. Why Professor Verdi? Lydia asked. He's a bad boy. Is that good? Oh yes, and he's handsome, and stylish, and totally cool. The word is that he's a vampire. What? There are vampires called daywalkers, that are immune to sunlight. The rumour is that he's one. Why is that a good thing? Tessa looked at her. Lydia felt it was a look of pity. Then Tessa sighed. You'll understand one day. Bad boys are bad, but you just know you could make them be good for you. Especially if you're a bit bad for them. It's like a challenge. Lydia shook her head and shrugged. Tessa sighed again. This sigh was more resigned than dreamy. One day was all she could say. They went up to the first-year girls' dormitory. The students, though, were already leaving for dinner. Lydia could hear the name Harry Potter running around the room in a whisper, like the wind through a field of barley. A couple of the girls said hello to Lydia and Tessa, probably more to Tessa, Lydia thought, on their way out. Tessa turned to Lydia as the last pair of girls left. There are wash basins by the beds, and a loo through the door at the end, if you want to freshen up. I'll meet you in the common room in fifteen minutes. Lydia was unable to speak before Tessa left the room. She was unsure how she would spend fifteen minutes. She didn't want to be late, but if she was early, she would be alone with however many students were still down there. They were all bigger than her. Admittedly, almost everyone in her year at her own school was bigger than her. The kids here were much bigger. Lydia heaved a sigh of defiance. She would just have to get on with it. She poured water from a large jug into a bowl on the table beside her bed. The jug was plain white, but the bowl had a fine blue pattern. She realised the pattern showed dragons, unicorns and other beasts she didn't recognise. She washed her face and hands, and was surprised to find the water was warm. Once she had finished, she dried her face on a small towel which hung on a rail on the washing table. By the time she had finished, the water had disappeared from the bowl, and the jug was full once more. She decided she needed to use the loo. She went through the door Tessa had indicated. The door had a remnant of gold lettering, which looked as though it had been polished and varnished almost out of existence. It read, Water Closet, though it took her a few seconds to make out the letters. Inside, the toilet itself was a little ornate, but surprisingly normal. Nothing especially magical happened. That was a relief. She went back and sat on the bed that had been called into existence just for her. That was a weird feeling. The cover was embroidered with magical creatures and strange plants, and knights on horseback next to tiny castles they could never have fitted into. It looked medieval. She opened her bag, which she had left there when she had gone to the potions class with Tessa. She rummaged through and found her phone. It was nothing more than a second-hand flip phone, but it was hers. She opened it and sighed. As she had been warned, the magic all around her had confused it. The display showed a small checkerboard pattern, and it did not respond to any key presses. She turned it off and slipped it back into her bag. She bounced on her bed a few times and wondered if Tessa was ready yet. Without realising, she found herself outside the dormitory door and walking down the spiral staircase. Within moments, I was walking as slowly as I could, she mused. She was at the bottom of the stairs and walking out into the common room. There were a few boys playing a game at one table. There was an anxious girl frantically reading a book in an armchair by the fireplace, while a dejected boy in the next chair sat watching her. There were three girls in a corner, whispering and giggling. A tall boy was walking towards Lydia. Hi, I'm Eric Moss. I'm a sixth year prefect with Tessa. You must be Lydia, the tall boy said. Lydia noticed he had a blue shield-shaped badge with the letter P on it fastened to his robes. She relaxed. He was thin, with a large nose, a pallid complexion and large pale freckles. Yes, I must be, she replied. Oh my 
God, she thought, I'm turning into my uncle. I expect Tessa has mentioned me. Eric, he said. She's been very busy showing me around and introducing me to people. It must have slipped her mind. Lydia grinned without a great deal of conviction. Oh, uh, yes, I expect that's it. Very busy. She should be down any moment. Lydia smiled and nodded. Eric smiled and nodded back. A minute passed. It was a long one. Any moment now, Eric repeated. Another long minute crept past. And another. Eric was just about to speak again when Tessa stumbled through the door from the stairs. Oh, Eric, you're here, Tessa observed. Yes, thought I'd come with the two of you to dinner, in the Great Hall, tonight, he scrambled to say. It's all right, Eric. You don't need to. We're fine, Tessa assured him. Nonsense. Prefectly duties, you know. Prefects together. Prefecting. You know, all that sort of thing. Come on, then, she said, with a tone of abject resignation. After you, ladies, Eric grinned, pointing the way to the portrait hole. Tessa led the way until Eric ran up from the rear, pushing past them both to open the portrait for them. They are Tessa, Lydia, he simpered. He gestured again, as though they might not have realised where the doorway was or how to use it. Thank you, Eric, said Tessa in the same flat-toned voice. Thanks, said Lydia, noticing that he actually had nice teeth, and also noticing that he was paying her no attention at all. His gaze was completely devoted to Tessa. They made their way down the various stairways to the Great Hall. Eric seemed to need to have things to say, now that Tessa was with them. He described the paintings as they passed, even though he had nothing to say, other than what they could have seen at a glance. As they entered the Great Hall, Lydia was overwhelmed. The buzz of conversation was as she had expected, but the sheer scale of the hall was not. The high vaulted ceiling made all the noise bigger but less distinct, turning it into a roar. And the ceiling looked like the sky. Lydia looked around. Four immensely long tables, flanked on either side by benches, ran almost the length of the room. At intervals above each of these tables hung huge banners of the four Hogwarts houses. They didn't hang from anything, and they just hung in the air as far as Lydia could see. At the far end of the hall, on a raised dais, another table ran across the hall's width. Adult witches and wizards, presumably the professors, sat there, talking and eating and watching over the students. In the middle of this staff table, in a high-backed chair, was the head teacher, Professor Lee. As Eric led them along the Gryffindor benches, Lydia could make out that Harry was seated on one side of the head teacher, and her uncle to the other side of Harry. Eric took them as close to the top table as possible. It looked for a moment as if he was considering moving a group of first-year boys so that they could sit right at the end. But Tessa sat quickly down, in the nearest available gap, and Eric scrambled to sit next to her. Lydia sat between Tessa and some first-year girls. She considered waving to Uncle Ambrose, just to annoy him, but realised he would certainly do something embarrassing in their retaliation. Exactly what he might do, she didn't know, and was reluctant to find out. Anyway, he was deep in conversation with an unusually small old wizard, who was perched on a pile of cushions on the chair next to him. Tessa invited Lydia to help herself to the food that kept appearing in Turin's dishes and bowls at intervals along the table. Eric started to explain something about the food and the kitchens, but, as he was having to lean over Tessa to do so, Tessa growled his name at him, and he sat back. Tessa raised her eyebrows at Lydia in exasperation. Tessa introduced Lydia to the group of girls next to her. Lydia is in your dorm tonight, maybe for the next few nights, Tessa told them. She's a friend of Harry Potter. They all looked up to the head aura at the top table. As if on cue, Harry noticed them looking and waved, then raised a glass to toast them. Lydia was taking a drink of pumpkin juice at the time, and raised it to him in return. The other girls scrabbled for goblets to copy the gesture. "'We saw you in potions,' said the girl next to Lydia. "'That's right,' 
Lydia grinned. You were one of the two who got the sleeping draught exactly right. Jessica, isn't it? Jessica Vance, yes. Welcome to Hogwarts. I bet you're looking forward to coming here next year. Mmm, Lydia nodded. As the meal progressed, Lydia got to know the first-year girls. Tessa added a few things to the conversation. The girls all liked Tessa. Eric tried once or twice to make a contribution, but he was a little too far away. Lydia felt sorry for him. Tessa had her back to him much of the time, and he looked desperate to join in. Tessa could hardly have made it clearer that she was not interested in him. It was cruel of her, Lydia thought. They were prefects together, after all. After the meal was over, they all went back up to Gryffindor Tower. The girls pulled a group of seats together in the common room to sit and talk. Eric slunk away to sit with a couple of boys about his age. Tessa and the others told Lydia tales of Hogwarts life. She learned that the small professor she had seen her uncle talking to was Professor Flitwick, a charms professor and a veteran of the Battle of Hogwarts. In return, Lydia was able to tell them some of the details of the battle she had heard from Harry. The others loved this. Harry Potter was obviously a famous hero to them all. They talked on concerning their teachers. Professor Longbottom was another hero and another friend of Lydia's. Professor Marcus, a transfiguration teacher, was ancient but still acted like he was young and handsome. They had to admit he dressed well, but he was in no way attractive. Tessa said he had been a lady killer. This shocked Lydia, but the conversation had moved on to the apparently dreamy Stefano Verdi. Tessa was not his sole admirer. Most of the other girls were enthusiastic. They were awed yet jealous that he had paid Lydia so much attention in class that afternoon. Once or twice, Tessa had to remind the girls to keep their voices down, as others were studying for the upcoming exams. Lydia had a fascinating time with her new friends. She learned about the school, the staff, the ghosts, the latest fads, and even about Quidditch, which she still didn't understand, despite Ginny, Harry, Ron and Draco all having tried to explain. She supposed it was something she would have to see to appreciate. Eventually, Tessa had to draw the discussions to a close. She reminded them they had lessons in the morning and all had to go to bed. As they wandered off to their dormitory, Lydia hung back for a moment to speak privately to Tessa. So, Eric, Lydia ventured. Don't, Tessa pleaded. Please don't. He seems to like you. Really, just don't. He's not that bad, Lydia decided. He's not bad at all. That's the problem. He wouldn't know how to be bad. He's just chirpy and helpful and lives to serve, like a stretched house elf. You mean he's not a bad boy? Exactly. He just wants to do whatever I say. Tessa's voice was an exasperated plea. I wish just one person would do what I want. Just once, Lydia sulked. Tessa looked at her and laughed, while shaking her head. You'll learn, one day, but for now, good night, and off to your dorm. As Lydia arrived in the first-year dorm, the girls were getting changed for bed. Lydia took her pyjamas from her bag and changed into them. Not surprisingly, the conversation started up again. Jessica and a girl called Abby joined Lydia, sitting beside her on her bed. Most of the others crowded onto the two beds nearest to Lydia's. Lydia noticed that a couple of the girls, who were yawning widely, crawled into their beds and drew their hangings about them. After another half an hour or so, some more of the girls were yawning, Lydia among their number. The others took the hint and let them get to sleep. Lydia had hardly finished drawing the hangings when she lay back and drifted directly to sleep.